All right, so Bitcoin mining is one of the areas that, as you guys know, we cover quite a bit here on the show. We always look at alternative energy ecosystems out there. We've had miners on our show from HUD A to Marathon, et cetera. And today is going to jump in a little bit differently, I think, but focusing on a potential nuclear miner and how that might play out uh, in Bitcoin as a whole. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. Joining me today is Paul Prager, who's the chairman and CEO of TerraWolf, along with Carrie Langlais, who is the chief strategy officer over at TerraWolf. So great to have both of you on the show. Thanks Thank for having you, us. So let, let's just kind of get into it a little bit in general. Paul, we'll start with you. And, you know, when you, for the framework of mining, because I think most everybody that watches our show, they follow everything from, you know, Bitcoin mining stocks the publicly traded ones to miners in general because they want to maybe they're interested in bitcoin as a whole and it's and it's uh energy uh scenario that plays out talk to me about what makes terrawolf unique and different sure um terrawolf is vertically integrated and we're energy infrastructure people so for the last 30 years you know our team has been uh, uh, designing building developing uh, restructuring power plants uh, all different kinds, um, solar, wind, hydro, coal, and gas. So uh, on the margin, Bitcoin mining is energy infrastructure. I mean, it is, it, is, it is the key to being able to drive costs lower. It is the key uh, to being able to have efficient operations. And so uh, we started out, you know, we had a, we had a power plant in, uh, in Montana that we we put on uh, with Marika Komodo at Marathon way back when. We built out that facility. I think uh, in the beginning, Marathon had three to five employees. We were the mm -hmm. 45 other folks uh, that actually uh, gamed the site, sold them the electricity, built out the facility, operated the plant. Um, we, we wanted to form a company uh, to do it our way. Uh, and our way meant, you know, with a real focus on energy infrastructure as opposed to the host model. I think that's critical. I think it, it, it drives costs. Uh, it enables a better regulatory program. Uh, and, um, and so we're entirely vertically integrated. And the other element to it that was critical to us, having been in the power space for 30 years, was we wanted to be all about zero carbon, not buying carbon credits, not doing anything, but actually generating Bitcoin with zero carbon facilities. So yeah. what was the genesis of TerraWolf? And that's what we're all about. Today, you know, I think we're about less, you know, less than a month away from five and a half X ash, um, lowest cost sites in North America. Uh, I would argue Lake Merritt and Nautilus are the two finest uh, Bitcoin mining generation facilities in the United States. Um, welcome you to visit, by the way, Paul. And yeah. um, and so we're all about that and the ability to scale at our sites, because at the nuke, we're at what, two gigawatts and a power and Lake Mariner, you know, we have up to we, we once we retired an 800 megawatt facility there. So interesting. Real scalability. I was looking at your website on the facilities. I'm looking here, I think, at Lake Mariner uh, right here on screen right now. And then you've got the Nautilus crypto mine, this one right here. So great facilities. I mean, obviously, uh, is this the only thing that these facilities do? Are they going into other aspects of mining as a whole, or is, is it all centered around Bitcoin and Bitcoin miners? We're about Bitcoin mining. Okay. So uh, these are fantastic. I mean, these are large facilities, uh, all generating uh, pretty significant zero carbon footprints, which I, you know, I think this is one of the things that obviously is the biggest challenge for the industry. And I would ask you, and I want to kind of start with you, Carrie. Um, when you look at the aspect of the narrative that is centered around Bitcoin right now, do you think Bitcoin has an energy problem, or do you feel like it just is, hasn't the right message hasn't been given to you know the general population? I think there's a lot. Of, there's a, a big misunderstanding in number one how the energy grid works in the United States and then how Bitcoin mining facilities can be an asset uh, to the grid. You know, location is everything. Siting a mining facility in the middle of New York City obviously is not going to make sense, but there are locations where there's a significant amount of renewable resources that are often stranded. 
um, you know, our two locations uh, each have that same, um, you know, issue where the supply out, out is outweighs the demand. And so there's an imbalance. And as you have, you know, increasing amounts of intermittent um, power sources like wind and sun that, that don't generate all the time, you need sort of a steady load to help and, and serve as a tool to the grid to stabilize it. So I think that people uh, take for granted actually the use and the valuable nature of Bitcoin mining, given it's you know really the purest form of a highly flexible load uh, and how that can serve to decarbonize the grid. All right, so so getting uh, past that, and I think this is something that we're going to probably face on the regulatory front quite a bit over the next few years, whether people be, you know believe and or understand what you're talking about in terms of the energy grid and its composition around what Bitcoin mining you know does in terms of drawing upon that, getting lawmakers to understand that is going to be really key because obviously their their ESG formula that that seems to be uh, resonant within um, DC. It's a real, you know, it's a real narrative that is uh, working its way through the crypto community. Obviously, Bitcoin being one of the biggest uh, in that. When you look at um, the aspect of not only the mining component of it, but if you look at the variations, so we've had many miners on our shows. Uh, you get everything from solar, wind, um, even now off gas with some of these methane uh, flaring uh, devices that can utilize that. How would your technology rack up or stack up next to those kinds of components out there, yeah. those alternatives in the market? Maybe you can take that one, yeah. Paul. Well, let me first go back to your prior question, which is, you know, I think one of the other challenges um, that our market faces is that, you know, we're one of the only folks out there that are truly vertically integrated. So when right. you've got all these other miners, you know, what do they really understand about energy infrastructure? I mean, they have a procurement contract at a host site um, where all the costs are being passed through by either the grid operator or the owner of the site. And so you have a, multiple voices speaking ultimately to a local regulatory regime, and they're not always incentivized in the same manner. So I think that's somewhat problematic. I think the beauty of being a vertically integrated energy infrastructure company is that we've been working with the grid, with the power authorities for the last 20 years in the sites because we own these sites. We've operated mm -hmm. power plants at them. We understand demand and load. And so it's not just a contract for curtailment that we're negotiating. We, we, we actually work with these folks all the time. So we haven't had, for instance, in New York State, we haven't suffered any of the regulatory challenges that many other uh, miners have had. So I think right. it's an important element here to focus on the team, their energy infrastructure experience, and, and do they therefore have a better way to communicate a response to concerns about the regulatory? The second, in more response to your, you know, uh, more recent question is, listen, we're nuclear power. We're, we're, we're a zero carbon miner at massive scale. I mean, at massive scale. Mm -hmm. So how do you compete with that? You know, the nukes are constantly spinning, right? We have a requirement in our country, and I'm glad for that, to always have reserves on margin for those terrible energy days. And so we're an anchor tenant for these, for these facilities. And I think, therefore... Um, we'll have higher uptimes uh, and lower electricity costs, and ultimately, because of the scale of these sites, lower operating costs. Right. Finally, I would tell you that when you think about the regulatory regime, ultimately, I believe the low-hanging fruit is going to be fossil fuel, and those costs ultimately will go back to the customer, whether it's a Bitcoin mining facility or an individual who's, who's using the electricity to manufacture mm -hmm. something else. And yeah. so we won't suffer those pass-through costs, um, which will give us somewhat of a competitive advantage. Yeah, that would be a, 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 a huge competitive advantage with some of the ones that I've seen. I've had a chance to visit a few miners. And uh, now you guys are, what, in upstate? Uh, you're in the Northeast, right? Yep, upstate New are York all, and Pennsylvania. Okay, so Pennsylvania and, and New York. And as far as you had mentioned New York uh, in, in terms of just how the energy system works within that, if you go beyond that area, are there any other nuclear sites globally that Terra Wolf is considering or maybe looking to expand? 
Sure. Sure. I, I, I mean, mean I think, uh, go ahead, ahead Gary. We've had conversations with a number of uh, the owners of nuclear assets because when I think when you start to understand and appreciate how enabling having a co-located Bitcoin mining facility, which has the ability to respond in the matter of minutes, if not seconds, uh, it, it really um, you know, draws a light bulb to the minds of people that are trying to figure out how uh, to to sustain the fixed cost nature of these assets. If you think right. about the grid and power assets in particular, it's a fixed cost system, right? And the single most important component to term- determining the power cost that you and I and and everyone um, pays for is system utilization. So if you have the ability to bring a significant load that can be highly flexible and utilize power in locations that are remote and stranded and may not be able to absorb mm-hmm. it on their own, you're you're increasing the system utilization that is reducing the cost of power for everybody. And so I think that's part of the issue that people don't appreciate, and particularly for nuclear uh, facilities like ours in Susquehanna, uh, at Susquehanna, which is in central Pennsylvania, power needs to either travel southeast to Philadelphia or west to Pittsburgh to meet, meet those demand pockets. And so what we're doing is we're actually bringing the demand to site, to the source and enabling the plan to run base load, which was what it's designed to do. All right. So, okay. So I, I like the, the concept around, especially if you go into remote locations and other assets around the world, the potential of being able to really kind of leverage the benefits of not only cost, but also utilization, which is going to make those sites even more effective and more, util- more I guess, in, in scenario could be good for them from a regulatory standpoint, maybe within their own government. So, It'll be interesting to see how you guys continue to expand upon that. Do you think with nuclear, and I think this is the question that everybody always asks around nuclear, um, and I know there's a lot of nuclear sites here in the United States. I mean, we've got them here in Florida. They're all over the place. Do you feel like there's any pressure now that we've seen the energy pressure around the world to spin up more nuclear sites? Because we've seen uh, in Europe, maybe some of, of which have been shutting down nuclear plants, any potentials of that reversing and starting to go back into more of the nuclear age again? You want to take that one, Paul? Sure. I mean, listen, I mean, nuclear power is very compelling. Um, there's been some technology advancements. Um, the, the, the challenge to nuke um, is even now, if people were willing to go ahead with it and decided all of a sudden it's good, it's green, and I think it is, um, there's a massive cost barrier to build yeah. a nuclear power facility. Um, and so uh, I think I think it will be quite some time before we see, you know, advanced development of nuclear power facilities, uh, though I think they're talking about some smaller facilities uh, that are quite interesting. Um, but again, I think it takes time. Uh, I'm less interested in nuclear power facilities around the world than I am here in the United States, where uh, we've always had a great industry. I mean, the best in the world, peerless, uh, with, from a safety uh, perspective and regulatory environment. And I think there's plenty of capacity here in the United States um, that will be enabling to Bitcoin mining. Um, so I, I don't want to look far afield and worry about, you know, rule of law in other countries and, you know, the, the the, the cost to a company of operating far-flung assets as opposed to, A, we have massive scale right here in Pennsylvania and upstate New right. York. B, we have plenty more opportunities here in the United States um, of world-class, you know, nuclear facilities. And, and that will be, you know, our primary focus. I was looking at the map here, uh, nuclear power plants in general, a lot obviously here on the eastern, uh, the eastern sea, seaboard. Um, and so in terms of expansion, because obviously with any miner to be able to really kind of take it up a level, is there any plans right now, Carrie, for you guys to maybe look at some additional facilities? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the valuable aspects to our platform and our two assets is that we don't need to sort of uh, evaluate or find another site to, to expand our, our exahash. Both at New York and uh, Pennsylvania, we have the ability to more than double our exahash today um, at those particular sites. And so when we okay. look, and I, you know, location's everything, but scalability is also 
uh, critical to siting our location. So right now we have 60 megawatts operating in our New York facility. We're about to, to expand that by another 50 megawatts here in a matter of weeks, but we can increase that site to up to 500 megawatts. Oh wow! Uh, in Pennsylvania, okay. we have we have 50 megawatts operational now. We have the op we have the option to expand that today by another 50 megawatts. But again, as Paul mentioned, that's a two and a half gigawatt nuclear power plant located in a place where there's not a tremendous amount of demand. So plenty of upside for you guys to grow within the current right. facilities that you have right now. Let's go and jump into regulation for a second. Obviously, we've been reporting on a lot of committees that are looking at crypto in general. Bitcoin obviously has a little bit of a different fanfare to it because of its uh, consideration as a commodity, handled quite a bit differently. But at the same time, it kind of gets grouped in there just from a, you know, a, a perception uh, standpoint. Are you guys doing anything with DC right now in terms of regulatory alignment or helping DC understand really what's facing, especially the Bitcoin mining community here in the United States? And the answer is absolutely yes. Again, we've been in the power business for a very long time. We've had a DC office to deal, you know, what is power? Power is yeah. real estate with electricity in a regulatory environment. So we've been dealing with the regulatory uh, notions surrounding energy infrastructure for a very long time. Uh, and it would be only prudent to continue uh, to ensure that we will re well represent it. Um, headquarters here is in Maryland. Uh, our senators and, and governor are, um, and, and legislature, you know, well informed of what we do. Um, mm -hmm. We have a fellow, Mike Enright, who runs this program for us and has for over 15 years. Um, so we're now starting to broaden our approach in terms of a national plan uh, because I think it's important um, that we have a voice in, in how we want to address the regulatory environment, given that our perspective is very different than, if you will, a lot of folks like Marathon who are really just host models. Um, but we, we own our sites, we own the plants, and it's very important that we can represent to the regulators what we think is, is an appropriate regime. Right. I was looking at this article here, uh, reporting significant growth. I, Paul, you actually made a pretty bold stock purchase also of your own stock. If you look at, I mean, and this is common with any executives that are looking at the growth of a company like this, but if you look at growth for a publicly traded company, especially in this space right now, and the capacity, I think, of people understanding that Bitcoin is starting to become a real asset that is maybe going to separate from the risk asset class, I think, in, this, in the near future. When you look at the upside, and maybe this should be for Kerry, when you look at the upside of future for you guys, what would be in your roadmap over the next, say, 18 months, 24 months, as we start to see, you know, the Bitcoin hash rate start to get compressed, obviously, with the next halving? How are you guys mm -hmm. going to be dealing with that? Well, as we look towards the halving, our number one priority is being the lowest marginal cost provider. And what's going to enable us to do that is to ensure that our power costs stay low. If you look at um, sort of the, the unit economics of a Bitcoin miner, uh, power cost is obviously the most significant piece. And if you take even just a one cent differential and then you adjust for the halving, that's going to sort of determine whether a Bitcoin miner can be profitable or not profitable. So again, focusing on profit is, is squarely where our priority is. In terms of uh, thinking about the future, I think we've seen over even the course of the, of the last few weeks and, and more so significantly in the last couple of weeks, I think the use case for the network itself is really proving itself out. And obviously over time, uh, the block reward is going to be less and less uh, the revenue that's earned by a Bitcoin miner and transaction fees or other ancillary re revenues will start to play a more significant role. And so I think there's tremendous opportunity for Bitcoin miners where, where we're essentially the heart of this validation. Yeah. All right. So, Carrie, let's go into a little bit more around long term for TerraWolf. What else is planned for you guys over the years? Where are you guys looking to? Anything additional? Yeah, and, and, and Paul, please add, but I think we're going to see an inflection point. Again, it's 140 plus years before the last Bitcoin is mined, so we've got some time. But I think over time, you're going to see the reward, the block reward, becoming less and less of yeah. uh, the full component of a Bitcoin miner's revenue and having transaction fees and other revenues like um, ancillary revenues and supporting the grid become a bigger share. 
And so as we think about our business plan today, we are focused on ensuring that we have a significant part of our revenue stream coming from things other than the block reward. Okay. All right, cool. All right, so let's look at one other thing I wanted to talk about, and that is how to potentially kind of get to, I guess, almost like a scoreboard. This is something that Solana is doing right now uh, around their overall footprint. They're, you know, kind of just showing the number of validators, you know, their RPC nodes, et cetera, total energy consumption. Why not see these kinds of things for Bitcoin? This is one of the, we have yet to see one for Bitcoin, really, what, from any miner. Are, are you guys looking at doing any kind of dashboard or reporting like that that would be a live stream of, of what's happening in the Bitcoin mining industry? Yes, 100%. So I think part of the challenge with the Bitcoin mining sector as a whole is you have you know more than two dozen public companies and no real standardized way of disclosure. So you've got some no. companies that are disclosing things in one way, others uh, in another, and it becomes extremely challenging for an investor to sort of put them side by side. Given our background in energy infrastructure, we think of things sort of in a pure commodity context. And so we think about our business and our profitability in unit economics. What is the portion of power per Bitcoin mined? What is that cost? What is our operating expense per Bitcoin mined? Um, and what is our overhead per Bitcoin mine? And you can stack those things up. And the investor that now has the tools to very easily evaluate the company's profitability in different Bitcoin price environments and different, different network difficulty uh, environments. And so what we're trying to do at TerraWolf is really set the standard for disclosure. And we hope that others will, will sort of join the same way so that it becomes much more of a transparent um, you know, environment for disclosure in terms of financials and, and costs and what's underlying the profitability. And we can really compare peer to peer. Yeah. Okay. All right. So and what I, would I you want say? To add to that, Paul. Go ahead. Go ahead, I was Paul. Just add, I think, you know, the dashboards are cool, but the most important thing to do is to set a standard for transparency and financial reporting. A lot of folks out there are telling you their I revenues, agree. but are they really telling you how much they make? Um, and so I think that's what our, you know, CFO Patrick Fleury was brought on to do. And I think if you rip through our disclosures, it's fantastic the amount of information that we provide. The other thing I would tell you is that we also provide, you know, all the information in terms of our own investment. In, in TerraWolf, management and insiders own over 55% of the company. Yeah. So we are very much aligned with our shareholders. And so rather than sort of follow these models, which lead to, massive dilution. We are 100% aligned with our shareholders. We want to run this company to make money. That's why we're doing it. We are running the company to make money. And you mentioned, you know, I made a bet, you know, in terms of buying the stock. It's not a hard bet. We, yeah. we, we you know, we have you know, invested over $12 million hard money in the last year just in buying our own stock. Um, you know, it's tough markets. We felt the need to support the company, but we're delighted with the investment. We haven't sold a thing. We haven't sold, uh, you know, one thing. So I think that transparency and reporting and management's commitment to the company and to remain in alignment with shareholders is another important driver as people look at the investment opportunities in the space. Uh, what would be your number one, if you had a dartboard right now, and you're concerned in terms of whether it's growth, regulation, whatever it might be, maybe your own internal capacity, or is it the tech stack that's required for the mining components, everything from GPUs to things like what, I know you guys are partnered with Bitmain, but what do you think is like the number one thing that you're really concerned about going forward? You know, I'm very comfortable with the tech stack. I'm very comfortable with our scalability and our ability to grow. As Kerry indicated, we have a lot of megawatts that are just shovel ready. My job right now is to drive costs down. I want okay. to ensure that we remain the lowest cost, high quality operator in the space, period. We do that, we win. And that's all we got to do. And so yeah. that is my focus. And, you know, at the same time that we're accomplishing that, you know, Patrick is setting the standard for financial reporting. Kerry is setting the standard for driving strategy towards the zero carbon environment and ensuring that we're well represented on the regulatory side. And I think if we do that, you know, we, we're going to end up making our shareholders a ton of money. And that's my goal in life. Yeah, good stuff. 
All right. Well, Paul, Kerry, thank you so much for uh, coming in today. We're, we're going to be doing more coverage on uh, the mining category, mainly because of what we see as a potential, I wouldn't say roadblock, but it's going to be something that will be pointed to by regulators in the future. And uh, as we get more information out there, I think it's just good for the industry to, you know, both investors, but also just people learning about Bitcoin, maybe for the very first time, just to understand there are alternatives out there that are actually uh, very efficient uh, in being able to go forward. So uh, good luck to what you guys are doing there at TerraWolf. Thanks for stopping in today. Nice to meet you. And thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. All right. So you guys are tuned in, maybe over on the podcast side of things right now. Make sure and jump over here to the YouTube channel. It's the one place where you can not only uh, get involved on our live streams, uh, but all you have to do is click that little bell. But you can also join into the Diamond Circle. That's our private uh, email group. It goes out. Uh, we have additional podcasts, additional content and research, all that stuff down below. Just click the link down there. And of course, if you want to reach me, it's out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.